Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Henry George School. For uh, those who are new, welcome to the Henry George School uh, to our special lecture on the political economy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Our speaker tonight is Ed Dodson. Ed, without uh, further ado, the floor is yours. I see you have 91 slides. Okay, Ibrahim. Uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, I became very interested in what Martin Luther King had to say on economics or political economy and what were some of his ideas uh, that would contribute to the solving of the problem of generational poverty in this country and perhaps elsewhere. Um, somewhat unusual tonight, I would ask that you refrain from asking questions or making comments during the presentation. Hopefully we'll have plenty of time after I finish. So I encourage you to take some notes, uh, any, any issues that come up in your mind that you'd like to bring up, we'll, we'll cover at the end. But this is really uh, telling a story. And so I want, want to use the time to tell the story from beginning to the end. To start with, we know that Martin Luther King, as the leader in the nonviolent approach to gaining full civil liberties and equality opportunity for persons of color, that's that's what his you know fame is for. That's that's what his objective was primarily. But less appreciated is his broader concern to really end poverty uh, and the existence of poverty in his book in 1967. Uh, where do we go from here, chaos or community? He was looking ahead to the day when racial discrimination was no longer tolerated. He knew this would not bring an end to poverty, that more had to be done. And so that was the focus of a lot of his energy. Now, um, bear with me, hit the wrong. Uh, Well, uh, what about King's thinking? Where did it come from? Well, it had evolved over sec or several decades and an unlikely association developed with a journalist turned congressional staffer named Walt Rybeck. And uh, it was really thanks to King's friendship with Walt Rybeck that King was introduced to the writings of Henry George, the 19th century American political economist. Well. Uh, who was Walt Rybeck? Well, he, in his in his autobiographical book titled "Resolving the Economic Puzzle," Walt explains that Coretta Scott King, or when she was Coretta Scott, became one of his closest friends while they were students at Antioch College. In Walt's own words, he says, "She was an aspiring singer before she married Martin Luther King Jr." Hearing her tell about the indignities her family suffered while she was growing up in Alabama was heartbreaking. Black churches around Ohio invited her to sing, and I went along as an accompanist. Mixed race couples were seldom seen in those, seen in those times. We were never physically harmed as we traveled, but if looks could kill. We were relieved to reach the churches where the audiences invariably, invariably received me with the same warmth as Coretta. Uh, after college, Walt began what began, became a remarkable career as a journalist. Uh, he worked at the Dayton Daily News, where he happened to come across and read Henry George's book, Progress and Poverty. Uh, he was soon drawn into the small community of the followers of Henry George scattered around the globe. Then after John F. Kennedy became president, what was appointed the Washington bureau chief for Cox newspapers. And so that put him at the center of the political activity of the nation. And of course, uh, as the work of Martin Luther King Jr. increased, the opportunity came for them to spend some time together on occasion. How frequently Walt continued to see the Kings in subsequent years, he doesn't say in his autobiography. He only mentions a 1965 luncheon following King's meeting with Lyndon Johnson. 
what is clear is that thanks to Walt, King had come to understand that racism was only one cause of generational poverty and that there were problems in our system of law and our economics. Deep changes in the nation's economic system were called for. King was convinced that this was the case. There were many people of every race who were born into and remained in poverty all their lives. However, Blacks suffered the most institutional disadvantages. The history of land settlement offered a crucial insight into the effects on persons of color, as King observed. He writes, After the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. And there's more he has to say. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. And finally, not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. He felt there was time for reparations, of course. And that has been in the debate ever since, uh, whether or not Blacks and others who've been disadvantaged in the system are owed reparations. And King will have more to say on that later. But let me give you some, for those of you who don't have any real knowledge of his biography, talk a little bit about his life. He was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1929. He attended the Booker T. Washington High School until 1948. Although he had not formally graduated from high school, he was admitted to Morehouse College. And at Morehouse, he, King was introduced to the writings of such philosophers as Henry David Thoreau, which had a lasting influence on the direction of his activism. He later wrote, During my student days, I read Henry David Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience for the first time. Here, in this courageous New Englander's refusal to pay his taxes and his choice of jail rather than support a war that would spread slavery's territory into Mexico, I made my first contact with the theory of nonviolent resistance. He graduated from Morehouse in 1948 and then entered the Crozer Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. Now, as a student at Crozer, King began to broaden his study of what might be called the great ideas. He recalls, I turned to a serious study of the social and ethical theories of the great philosophers from Plato and Aristotle down to Rousseau, Hobbes, Bentham, Mill, and Locke. All of these masters stimulated my thinking such as it was, and while finding things to question in each of them, I nevertheless learned a great deal from them from their study. King then decided to examine the rationale behind the communist ideology. He read Das Kapital by Karl Marx, as well as the Communist Manifesto. However, as a de devout Christian, King rejected the communist interpretation of history. Thus, although King thought Marxist ideology to be without principle and even evil in its fundamental nature, he acknowledged why others might embrace it as a path to escape from long-standing oppressions. He wrote, With all of its false assumptions and evil methods, 
communism grew as a protest against the hardships of the underprivileged. Communism, in theory, emphasized a classless society and a concern for social justice, though the world knows from sad experience that in practice, it created new classes and a new lexicon of injustice. To King, the Christian ought always to be challenged by any protest against unfair treatment of the poor. Importantly, he came to the conclusion that capitalism as practiced was inherently unjust and in need of specific reforms. He expressed his concerns this way. He writes, my reading of Marx also convinced me that truth is found neither in Marxism nor in traditional capitalism. Each represents a partial truth. Historically, capitalism failed to see the truth in collective enterprise, and Marxism failed to see the truth in individual enterprise. Nineteenth-century capitalism failed to see that life is social, and Marxism failed and still fails to see that life is individual and personal. Well, in Philadelphia, <clears throat> he then heard a sermon by Dr. Mordecai Johnson, president of Howard University, who spoke of his recent trip to India and the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi. King then decided to immerse himself in, into a study of Gandhi's life and works. He came to embrace Gandhi's strategy of nonviolent resistance as the answer to the unfair treatment of persons of color received in the United States. The question then arises, to what extent was King also influenced by Gandhi's views on reforms and how to end poverty? Well, Gandhi was a dedicated agrarian and championed the cause of the landless peasants. He supported the outright confiscation of land from India's large landowners to be distributed free of charge to the poor. It was his view that only those who actually worked the land should be permitted to own it. In his own words, he said, land and all properties is his who will work it. This is the basic land to the tiller idea. Excuse me a second. Well, years later, King was able to make the journey to India and visit Gandhi's place of birth. <clears throat> In a radio address made just before returning to the United States, here's what he had to say. Again, this is in India. Since being in India, I am more convinced than ever before that the method of nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people in their struggle for justice and human dignity. In a real sense, Mahatma Gandhi embodied in his life certain universal principles that are inherent in the moral structure of the universe. And these principles are as inescapable as the law of gravitation. In a November 1956 sermon, King presented an imaginary letter from the Apostle Paul to American Christians. And in this he stated, Oh America, how often have you taken necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes? God never intended for one group of people to live in superfluous, inordinate wealth, while others live in abject, deadening poverty. Speaking in 1963, King talked about the poverty that crossed the color line. He wrote, To this day, the white poor also suffer, suffer deprivation and the humiliation of poverty, if not of color. It corrupts their lives, frustrates their opportunities, and withers their education. In one sense, it is more evil for them because it has confused so many by prejudice that they have supported their own oppressors. Some of these are so powerful statements from King, and I hope, you know, listening closely and maybe even keeping some notes on um, King asked some of the same moral questions raised by others regarding the treatment of nature as private property. 
course. And this is a, the major observations from Henry George. King says something very similar. You see, my friends, you begin to ask the question, who owns the oil? You begin to ask the question, who owns the iron ore? You begin to ask the question, why is it that people have to pay water bills in a world that is two-thirds water? Despite the history of how persons of color were subjected to centuries of unjust law, King looked to government to secure economic rights. He described capitalism as it existed, as a system permitting necessities to be taken from the many to give luxuries to the few. The reforms he sought were directed toward achieving what political economists described as a just distribution of wealth. Government needed to be pressured to secure and protect economic as well as political rights. As King put it in a 1965 speech to the Negro American Labor Council, the good and just society is neither the thesis of capitalism nor the antithesis of communism, but a socially conscious democracy which reconciles the truth of individualism and collectivism. Call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all God's children. King observed that in the world of 1963, persons of color were the last hired and the first to be let go, all the more so because of improvements in the efficiency of industrial machinery. He states, the nation will also have to find the answer to full employment, including a more imaginative approach than has yet been conceived for neutralizing the perils of automation. Today, as the skilled and semi-skilled Negro attempts to mount the ladder of economic security, he finds himself in competition with the white working man at the very time when automation is scrapping 40,000 jobs a week. Though this is perhaps the inevitable product of social and economic upheaval, it is an intolerable situation, and Negroes will, know, will not long permit themselves to be pitted against white workers for an ever-decreasing supply of jobs. Well, King's vision of a world in which all persons felt part of society rested on a realization of full employment. To that end, he sent a telegram to President Lyndon Johnson. In that telegram, he writes, I propose specifically the creation of a national agency that shall provide a job to every person who needs work, young and old, white and Negro. I propose a job for everyone not a promise to see if jobs can be found. There cannot be social peace when a people have awakened to their rights and dignity and to the wretchedness of their lives simultaneously. If our government cannot create jobs, it cannot govern. It cannot have white affluence amid black poverty and have racial harmony. King understood that without the opportunity to earn a decent living, the social conflicts that would only escalate into political turmoil and violence, threatening the very life of the democracy that was potentially the promise of the United States as a society. Because the private sector had failed to deliver a full employment economy, King called upon the federal government to fill the void. We must develop a federal program of public works, retraining, and jobs for all, so that none, black or white, will have cause to feel threatened. At the present time, thousands of jobs a week are disappearing in the wake of automation and other production efficiency techniques. In an article he wrote appearing in the April 3rd issue of Saturday Review during 1965, King acknowledged that racial and economic problems in the northern states were far more serious than he had thought. His biographer, David L. Lewis, writes this. 
The illusion of freedom in the North had masked its hideous economic conditions. Matriarchal families whose morality was vitiated by perpetual dependence upon welfare programs, levels of unemployment that had actually risen in the decades since Montgomery, and agglutinations of the impoverished in substandard housing that had few equivalents even in the South. Late in 1965, King arrived in Chicago to add strength to a coalition form to take on Mayor Richard Daley and Chicago's very real racial and economic segregation. High on King's list of priorities was the terrible condition of rental housing units available to Chicago's persons of color and to poor whites. King could feel gratified to some degree when in August of 1966, Chicago's officials announced that $500 million would be invested in 22 depressed areas of the city over the next two years. Moreover, after prolonged negotiations with Mayor Daley, an agreement was reached that promised an end to housing discrimination. The lessons learned from, from the Chicago campaign were significant, King wrote. For years, I have labored with the idea of reforming the existing institu institutions of the society, a little change here, a little change there. Now I feel quite differently. I think you've got to have a reconstruction of the entire society, a revolution of values. Under circumstances of widespread discrimination in labor markets that faced persons of color, they had little hope of better pay and working conditions. According to King, unionization was one of the few responses available to them. Where Negroes are confined to the lowest paying jobs, they must get together to organize a union in order to have the kind of power that could enter into collective bargaining with their employers. King's final book, is also his statement of positions on raising the living standards of the poor among his fellow citizens. This is where do we go from here, chaos or community? And here he states, we must create full employment or we must create incomes. People must be made consumers by one method or the other. We realize that dislocations in the market operation of our economy and the prevalence of discrimination thrust people into idleness and bind them in constant or frequent unemployment against their will. What King understood is that the existing system never achieved full employment. Even without bigotry and prejudice, there would always be a large number of people left out of the mainstream. Well, faced with the same observations, the economist Milton Friedman argued for a negative income tax as a means of enabling people to obtain necessary, good, necessary goods with the minimum involvement of social engineering and government bureaucracy. In 1968, Friedman answered William F. Buckley Jr. on the merits of this proposal as follows. Friedman's Freeman told, uh, told Buckley, the proposal for a negative income tax is a proposal to help poor people by giving them money, which is what they need, rather than as is now, by requiring them to come before a governmental official, de detail all of their, all their assets and liabilities and be told, you can spend X dollars on rent, Y dollars on food, et cetera, and then be given a handout. King continued in his own analysis. He said, economic expansion alone cannot do the job of improving the employment situation of Negroes. It provides the base for improvement, but other things must, must be constructed upon it, especially if the tragic situation of youth is to be solved. In a booming economy, Negro youth are afflicted with unemployment as though in an economic crisis. They are the explosive outsiders of the American expansion. Ever since families left the land to work in the cities, we have experienced high rates of youth unemployment. 
As King observes, the problems have always been far more acute in the sections of our cities with predominantly poor households. And of course, in many cities, the number of African Americans living in sections with few employers has always been the greatest. Those who left the agricultural regions and sharecropping came to the cities to live and work, continuing to be sharecroppers, but with, with a different sort of landlord. Adults found their way into low-wage jobs, but the unskilled youth were simply left out altogether. As King expands on his observation, he says, depressed living standards for Negroes are not simply the consequence of neglect, nor can they be explained by the myth of the Negroes' innate incap incapacities or by more sophisticated rationalization of his acquired infirmities, family disorganization, poor education, etc. They are a structural part of the economic system in the United States. Certain industries are based on a supply of low paid, underskilled, and immobile non white labor. The challenge, King thought, was to identify the structural flaws in the nation's economic system and press for changes in law. As the followers of Henry George knew, the answer was to be found by looking at who owns the land and captures its rental value. For the poor living in American cities, few own any land or even a house. As I have just stated in a very real sense, they are urban sharecroppers. In his famous April 1967 speech at Riverside Church in New York City, King made a damning indictment of a budgetary imbalance that continues to this day. He told us a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Toward the end of his book, where do we go from here? King adds this. I am now convinced that the simplest approach will prove to be the most effective. The solution to poverty is to abolish it directly by a now widely discussed measure, the guaranteed income. The problem with this measure, in my view, is similar to the problem of the negative income tax proposed by Milton Friedman. King can be forgiven for failing to see the outcome. Friedman, the economist, should have thought through the issue more thoroughly. Increase household incomes broadly without increasing the supply of housing, and most of the increase in disposable income will end up in the pockets of landlords. At minimum, it's my view that government would need to construct millions of new housing units priced to be affordable to lower income households, whether that's for ownership or for rental. The estimate right now is that there is a shortage of about 7 million housing units for low and moderate income households in this country. By the time King wrote his final book, a large portion of the residential properties in U.S. cities was crumbling from age and neglect. This is just one example of how extensive it was throughout many cities scattered across the United States in the early 60s and even until fairly recent times. And in some parts of some cities, uh, in Philadelphia, for example, there's still significant sections that look like this even today. Martin Luther King was working hard to get people to Washington, D.C. in 1968. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference initiated the Poor People's Campaign, and King stood with them. As King prepared to join the Poor People's Campaign March on Washington, he added his voice to those calling for an economic bill of rights. He called for guaranteed employment for all willing and able to work, a living income for those not able to work, an end to discrimination in the access to decent affordable housing, and the integration of the nation's schools. In Richard Leischer's 1995 biography, The Preacher King, Leischer concludes as follows. 
He says, Martin Luther King was the last of the great liberals in America to identify the purposes of social reform with those of Christianity. He routinely cast the struggle for civil rights in terms of light and darkness, good and evil, and the two kingdoms. In an article in Look magazine, published just after he was murdered, Dr. King wrote as follows. He told Look's readership, we call our demonstration a campaign for jobs and income because we feel that the economic question is the most crucial that Black people and poor people generally are confronting. There is a liberal, a literal depression in the Negro community. When you have mass unemployment in the Negro community, it's called a social problem. When you have mass unemployment in the white community, it's called a depression. And he adds, the fact is, there is a major depression in the Negro community. The unemployment rate is extremely high, and among Negro youth, it goes up as high as 40% in some cities. I would guess that it may be about the same rate today, but uh, someone else may have current statistics on that. Well, uh, I'm getting close to the end, and then you'll have an opportunity to join me in discussion. But to summarize what I believe I learned in this examination of King's positions on how to deal with poverty, he believed that government is there to ensure that all citizens have access to what Mortimer Adler called the goods of a decent human existence. In his experience, the system almost everyone chooses to call capitalism fails to deliver the goods. Therefore, the system had to be changed and government had to intervene on behalf of those at the margin. King embraced democracy, but a social democracy distinct from the social Darwinism defended by some who stand right of center in our society. Unfortunately, like most of his contemporaries who cared deeply about ending poverty, Martin Luther King Jr. apparently did not fully grasp the extent to which privilege dictates economic outcomes in our country. Or perhaps more accurately, he had not yet recognized some of the most powerful forms of entrenched privilege that do in fact plague our society. To be sure, his struggles helped to lessen privilege based on race or the color of one's skin. Every day we observe how other forms of privilege continue to threaten our very democracy and stand in the way of a society built on equality of opportunity. As we have, as have many before and since, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his life in an effort to help change the course of history. And so the struggle continues and to some has even intensified in the years since King's death. The work continues and we owe it to ourselves and to the legacy of Martin Luther King to keep at it. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ed, for uh, this fantastic presentation. Uh, we really have uh, plenty of time, and now we will open it for uh, Q and A. So let me unmute everyone. So, if you have questions, just use the reaction button to uh, raise your hand. I see. Uh... <clears throat> okay, that was a clap by Yanis. Yanis, do you have a question or a comment? I would um... be surprised if Yanis does not. <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know uh, I, I think <clears throat> I, I, I think King was was on the point uh, on the the phenomenology and the social ills of the time, and I think he also foresaw the impact of technology and automation on uh, on the working um, and the and the middle class. And I think also he was he was right that the issue of exploitation it's not racial. So in other words, just because you are born with a certain color on your skin doesn't guarantee you anything. And I think he he, he acknowledged that uh, in his time. And even uh, you mentioned the, the the example of the um, the housing conditions in Chicago with slumlords. 
I would invite anybody if they haven't read to read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, mm. where he describes the horrible conditions that mostly like East European and other Central European immigrants, you know, were subjected to in Chicago. I mean, abject conditions, you know, subhuman conditions of, of, of living. So, so I think he, he, he's, he's very astute and he's really to be commended that in a time where, where the racial discrimination of blacks were probably at its highest, he was able to parse past the, 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 the racial divide and see beyond that and acknowledge that there are other more powerful forces that can subdue humans and can create and, and proliferate exploitation in society. So I think he's really, really, uh, um, you know, a seminal figure in that, in that yeah. extent. One, you know, I, in the early part of my talk, I highlighted his relationship with Walter Rybeck and, and some of the folks who are attending tonight knew, knew Walt who passed away. Uh, I guess it's now about two years ago. Um, but, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. quotes Henry George in his final book. And he had this ongoing relationship with Walt. And so he had some exposure to other members of the Georgist community. And if it's my thought that if he had not been murdered, if he had lived another 20 years, that he might have been the charismatic person to bring Henry George's vision to reality because of the kind of following he had, not only within the Black community, but within the community of thoughtful people generally. And so it's a tragedy for, in many ways that King was murdered. And also at that time, uh, the, the notion of a guaranteed income who started to be propagating, I think it was around maybe the late 50s or the early 60s, that, uh, that the notion of the guaranteed income started coming out. And that in conjunction with the, full, with the idea of full employment shows you how, I mean, because that's the first reaction we get towards poverty. Oh, give somebody a job, give them an income. And yeah, well, it, and, 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 and of course, we don't realize that that doesn't solve anything. The same with agrarian reform that Gandhi was promoting. Agrarian reform never solved poverty because even if you give somebody a plot of land, well, they need uh, resources and machinery to, to, to cultivate it. Yeah. Not only that, mm -hmm. they need markets to sell their crops. And that's where most small farmers get get uh, get to 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 lose their farms and we see how the of, big agricultural of, firms now they have almost um um extinguished the uh, the american small and middle uh, middle farms and this is where the genius of henry george comes in because he says because what george says is you cannot help labor by increasing their wages the only robust way to help labor is by protecting labor from rent gouging and rent, and rent extraction. And I think if King, as you said, was, was not assassinated this early, maybe he would have, he would have come to this conclusion early on. Well, I think he would have had a you know, much King, more powerful impact. King's thinking had not yet evolved that far along the, the path of that we might have hoped. But it's interesting to me when you think about you know what I've what I've given you that it came from the libertarian community this this from Milton Friedman and and the libertarian perspective that uh, what was needed was to give people a job or an income and reduce the involvement in their lives of bureaucracy of but. On the left, the progressive left, for decades, the idea was to use government to create an increasing middle class among blacks and, and other minorities. And 
And there's some success to point to in that. But King recognized that that, that, was, that had its own cost because it was uh, something of social engineering. And so you, you take away from the individual the potential to achieve his or her potential by that kind of social engineering, bureaucratic control of lives. Uh, but, but neither the left nor the, the libertarian right man have managed even to today to come to the middle where Henry George occupies the most prominent, important position. And uh, you know, the game, the, the fight isn't over. And I wish we had Martin Luther King Jr. here as one of our allies to continue that campaign. Uh, anyone else have, have comments, uh, had, questions? Uh, Stephen Brown has a couple of questions. Stephen, would you go ahead and uh, say it aloud? You're muted, my friend. Oh, sorry, I'll have to. I'm not allowed to unmute. Go oh, ahead. Uh, okay. okay, Ibrahim is is monitoring to keep control of this discussion. But yeah, welcome. no, I, I, I'm very glad about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad. So, um, yeah, my question I had was that, um, I mean, here in Michigan, you know, um, we have a problem with state legislation that uh, prohibits the way we can collect property taxes, you know, which is central. I think to what uh, Henry George was proposing. So, what is there? What do you all? And I'm not so familiar with um, progress and poverty. I'm reading it right now. Uh, but what do you all think about um, municipalities or getting state legislatures to pass legislation that would allow us municipalities? I live in Ann Arbor here to well, institute split rate property taxes. Yeah. Well, I put, let me I put let the me question in the let chat. me first say you know. Um, I don't want this this uh, discussion to become primarily a discussion about Henry George's proposals for oh, tax yeah. reform. Okay. However, okay. Uh, you know you deserve an answer, and and in every every state, it is either the state constitution or at least there's legislation is required to give local communities the option to impose a two rate form of property tax. Um, I don't have the statistics. I don't have the answer on Michigan, but having been to a conference in Detroit some years ago to discuss some of these measures, I do remember that Michigan, Michigan's law puts uh, a high level of obstacles in the path to a good system of tax reform. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. so I wish you great success in, in trying to get uh some of your legislators to be willing to consider a bill that would give uh, local autonomy or local option to 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 communities and maybe INR is the best way to approach that in my view I don't know mm -hmm. okay thank you you're welcome Ed there is a question from uh, from Gil here he said sorry I missed the beginning of the presentation uh and maybe you covered this, but how did MLK say about how the guaranteed income would be financed? Income tax. Income tax. Pro okay. Progressive income tax. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, he he advocated a progressive income tax. Um, for what it's worth, I I support a a much more progressive form of income tax than we have in place today but with a great deal more simplification, which is sympathetic to King's uh, idea that we need to get rid of, you know, complexity. So um, my idea, and I would hope Martin Luther King Jr. would think of it, would be to exempt everyone's individual income up to the national median. So mm -hmm. that's half of the half of the people in the country would pay no federal income tax and eliminate all other exemptions and deductions, and then impose a, an increasing rate of taxation on higher ranges of income. And so perhaps we could get back to what had once been the highest marginal tax rate of 87% in the United States, and it would be a an actually effective 87% tax rate, which would fall, in my view, largely on unearned income flows. 
on rent derived income uh, and gains on the sale of assets, financial and otherwise. So uh, if Martin Luther King Jr. is listening somehow and can communicate that uh, to some of the folks who still look to him for guidance, um, please do that, Martin. <laughs> Ed, can I ask a question? Yes. Certainly. So uh, from taking your previous class, you know, I always try to connect it to the present, to the, our reality. Well, the present has certainly changed to some degree from, you know, the decades when Martin Luther King was, was, was observing the reality of his time. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, but... Uh, did, I did not quite uh, listen from the beginning, from the very beginning. Did I misunderstand that you said that that's not a solution if you give a person a job that is not a solution? I thought that was the solution. And I thought the creation of black middle class was the in you know the proof that that it works, you know that because and it's against the argument that, you know, that there is discrimination. And it's, to me, it was always a question of people wanting to work. And I think it was also proved during the epidemic, uh, when uh, a lot of people didn't work because it uh, paid them to stay home, they made more money. So what is well, your, I, just, I, I, I would, quite... well, let me answer the way I think Martin Luther King Jr. might. And, and I think he would say that human beings are motivated uh, by many different forces in their lives and, the, and as members of, of communities. And in, in when people are a member of a community, when they have a stake in that community, they tend to think to the future rather than to their immediate uh, gratification. Uh, so I think part of it, King would, would say, is a, is a matter of motivating individuals to seek their highest potential. And, and some people uh, need much more help than others in doing so. And many people, as we know, um, succumb to all sorts of temptations and weaknesses and mental stress, uh, physical duress. We, we are a complicated species. and the, the challenge is to create a socio-political environment that will, will add to the best that is possible to provide the environment and the incentive for, for people to achieve their, their, their highest and best potential. And for those who, for some reason, fail to do so, even if it's their own fault, that we have the capacity uh, that King would call love of humanity to do what we can to help them, to bring them along. And if, and if necessary, even uh, take care of them uh, if they're not able to take care of themselves. But the problem we've had is we have a, an economic system and economic theories that are defined as economic science is divine, defined as the study of the allocation of scarce resources. And so I think what, what, what King was looking for was creating a full employment society in which resources would no longer be scarce and that they would be justly distributed, which is exactly what you know I would hope for. And I think all of us probably in attendance here today, it's just a question of can we come to an agreement on how that's to be achieved? So that's, that's, I guess, the best, best response I have. Um, thank you. Hi, I have a question. Um, so I just want to real quickly preface my question by saying that I'm so happy I found this lecture. Uh, I am, I teach political science in the City Colleges of Chicago. I live in Chicago. Uh, I work in the faith community in Chicago and um, with uh, some justice movements. I'm on the Reparations Commission for the state of Illinois uh, that's newly founded in the last two months. And um, I was in New York this weekend. I just got back this morning and thought I'd be in New York for today's holiday 
Googled what was happening in New York around Dr. King's holiday and found this event. Great. And um, I was so excited to find it because this is the kind of uh, meaty and weighty conversation that I think is so critical on Dr. King's holiday when people are doing all other kinds of things to really talk about what kind of society he desired and not just you know do an act of service or, or remember some civil rights event, but really press into where we need to be today. And so my question uh, really is that, uh, you mentioned that um, King was uh, charismatic and powerful enough and respected to carry these ideas um, that were related to Henry George, um, but also, as you mentioned, he'd gotten from a lot of different philosophers um, to carry them uh, across the world. And if he were still alive, he'd be doing that. And you also mentioned that maybe we don't have sort of that kind of figure today. And I wanted to ask you specifically if there was um, anyone that you know sort of politically that uh, is conveying these ideas. I know Andrew Yang is obviously for the guaranteed income, but if there is no king today, uh, who do you think is sort of most closely uh, aligned with these ideas today and articulating them in the, in the, in the national public discussion? <laughs> what a question. Uh, I, I don't really have a good answer to that. It, 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 if, if the question is, can you identify a person who's thoughtful and sincere? There are any number of those people who are holding public office today. However, I think my view is that they hold public office in a system that makes it very difficult for them to pursue the kind of objectives that King would, would be pursuing. Uh, and everyone elected to public office almost immediately is pressured by their political party leaders to begin raising funds for the next campaign. And so they're, um, even if they decide themselves not to accept uh, political contribution from political PACs or corporations, it's still very difficult for them to get uh, these kinds of reforms on the political agenda. And part of it is, of course, our the ideological split that we have in this country that has worsened uh, and intensified you know, over the last three or four decades, uh, I would, you know, I would argue it began in the 1970s, culminating really with the election of Ronald Reagan to the presidency and his attempt to introduce the old idea of new federalism, which returned authority and responsibility for public policy as much as possible to the states. Mm -hmm. And so we lost the momentum for national cohesion around public policy and a definition, a consensus definition of human rights. So uh, I don't have, you know, I don't have, I can't put one person or even a handful of persons forward in answer. I, I guess, you know, part of the answer is, is what is often said about activism. Uh, activists should think globally and act locally, uh, but it's also true that we should act locally and think globally. And and so the work that all of us are doing has this twofold, you know, level of commitment required. Mm -hmm. um, I go to my mayor, I go to my city council, I go, but I also communicate to a larger world by involvement in other organizations that are reaching across countries. Um, so um, <laughs> all, I can, all I can encourage you to do is keep the faith, if, if faith is something that you have and, and, and work with it, keeping, you know, you found, you found us, you found the Henry George School, keep in contact with the Henry George School and you'll, you'll have an opportunity to uh, engage with people who have similar ideas and some there are some people in chicago that are that are often uh communicating through the henry george schools programs that you might be able to get in contact with yeah thank you i definitely will and yes i am a person of faith if you see my shirt uh it says that i'm a bears fan and uh, <laughs> that that is a faith statement right there <laughs> uh, yeah i'm
Well, I'm a Steelers fan, so there you go. We're both in the same boat this year. Exactly. Uh, Ed, I'm sorry, I have to respond to you. I, I, oh. I, I definitely disagree, and you know me, I cannot keep quiet. Speak when... your mind. So obviously you have certain views, and I believe I brought it up in your class before. You mentioned Reagan. Obviously, you belong to, to the other party. You mentioned Reagan. I don't think people I remember or realize, rather, that whoever emerges in this country is the product of democracy, and that person is elected by the majority, as opposed to the former Soviet Union or present Russia, which I gave you an example on numerous occasions, where a leader emerges by killing his opponents. Whereas here, the, per the person is uh, elected by having rallies, debates, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, somebody mentioned Stacey Abrams. I was listening to Inside Story in Philadelphia. George Bar Barrell was on it. Uh, he's a black person here. In fact, at one point was a candidate for mayor. And he said that he was surprised to see that state, that camp, who won the, the governorship in Georgia got 12% of the black vote as opposed years ago where he only got 5%. So when you say keep faith and I hope, the country is divided because people cannot come to terms. Do you understand? We still have a democracy. And every day when I listen to you people talk, I want to scream and say, and I gave you examples how I preached it to my students. You live in a democratic country. We, what is happening in Iran will never happen here. And don't they don't seem to realize that. So when well, you say, unfortunately, and whatever, this is a... a, a a political process, and he was elected. So, you know, then there were other people elected. Mm -hmm. Look, now Biden is elected, and they both are in the same type of scandal. And people are doing, uh, saying, wait, wait a minute, now what? Now what are we going to do? So please, let's be objective and not like switch to to, to take political sides. That's all well, I have to say. Let me, let me respond by, by saying that I, I hope that I am objective. Because you know my my formal academic work was was basically to study the history of our country and to reach certain conclusions of how we got to be where we are from where we began. And so this is a complicated history. And there's you know there there have always been from the very beginning threats to this system of democracy that you embrace and that I embrace and that we wish was even better than it is. There, there's a saying that the perfect is the enemy of the good, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive toward the perfect if we can. And so there are fundamental reforms, I believe, and that many people believe are required in order to protect the democracy that we have. And that there are threats to this democracy that exist in the system of laws, the system of governance that has evolved over time and changed. Some things have got, been for the better. Certainly, we the, the country went through a, a civil war in order to establish that the states were in many ways supposed to be subordinate to the national government. That was a de an outcome determined by victory in war, and it has taken since 1865 to today to try to determine whether or not that was the outcome that people really have desired. We still have a strong uh, uh, view that our states are nearly sovereign and only delegate a very specific portion of their sovereignty to the national government, whereas there is another view that the national government is the sovereign representative of the people and the states are more uh, accurately described as administrative districts. This problem is not resolved. It's not close to being resolved. And the debates are getting more strident uh, you know, on a daily basis. So Yes, we're not in the situation that the people in Russia or Iran are in, but 
but there's plenty of evidence that we should be concerned that we're moving in a direction that is extremely hazardous and could in fact affect the democracy that you describe and believe is, is uh, the virtue of our society. Great. Any other questions or comments? Well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just say quickly, we're having a bit of a conversation, as you can see in the chat, around her, her premise that the president is elected by the majority of the people in this country in a democracy. And I just would speak back to that and suggest that I don't necessarily believe that that is the case. Hmm given the electoral college. Well, the yeah. fact also that only in every, any, even in national elections, only about 50% of the eligible voters actually vote. Mm -hmm. And 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 the question of whether or not that is because people are apathetic or because they believe their vote uh, has no uh, real contribution to the outcome or that they are not represented by the candidates from any of the parties that are that are likely to be elected. Again, it's I mean it's the in my mind it raises a systemic question. And Ted, you've talked about the electoral college. Well, there's a there's a fundamental question there. Uh, the electoral college was created by people who were very much uh, in in favor of strong strong state sovereignty. That's what. That's when this when this country was founded, it was 13 indiv independent sovereign states that had gained their independence from the British Empire. And they then had to figure out, well, how much are we going to be 13 independent nations? Um, the decision was made. We need to have some unification because it's clear that eventually Great Britain, with its huge military capacity, its huge imperial presence, would be coming back, as the British did in 1812. And so without some sort of stronger national government, there was a fear of foreign invasion and the loss of that sovereignty. And then you follow it up with the rest of the history that Thomas Jefferson negotiated with Napoleon Bonaparte to buy the center part of North America, uh, even though you know, Napoleon had control of it for one day from Spain. And, and how is it that either Spain or France could claim sovereignty over half of the North American continent uh, without consideration either by them or by the United States government of the tribal societies that had lived there for generations. Uh, we have a lot to answer for in terms of how this country was formed. And um, some of us along the, along the way have thought we've been getting better at, at coming close to the promise of democracy. But, but, but uh, I'm not sure that that is a sentiment that's widely held today. We're not necessarily getting better. Uh, maybe we eventually will, but we certainly have some major struggles to get through. The electoral college is one. You know, I, I, you know, my thought is that one of the major reforms we need to preserve this democracy is taking money out of elections. We need publicly funded elections, in my view. Ted, I, I think I interrupted you, and I'm sorry. I no. should keep it. <laughs> You're good. Thank you. No, wonderful. Anyone else have any some some thoughts? You know, I've given you a lot about what Martin Luther King experienced and and what he concluded based on those that experience on his on his studies. You know, I mean, he spent the time to to read and study the great philosophers and came out of that with very specific views about what the right, the appropriate relationship between the individual and society is and ought to be, uh, and the shortcomings between that ideal and where, you know, we are as a society. And, um, and race relations was only the beginning of that shortcoming. <laughs> 
So anyone else, uh, anything in the chat that came up that ought to be discussed other than what Ted brought up? Well, I don't see anything. Uh, well, apparently uh, you're, you're, you're basically all pretty satisfied with what you heard from me as interpreting Martin Luther King Jr. So uh, I won't keep you any longer than you want to be here. Uh, so uh, Ibrahima, maybe you want to close out the session tonight, unless, unless there's some last minute comments or questions that want, people want to put forward. Well, I yeah. think there's a, oh, I'm sorry. I think there's a lot of conversation in the chat. We're just not verbalizing it, but there's a lot, particularly around this question of the electoral college and those sorts of things. But um, I would just say, I really appreciate your your dive into the, the philosophical pinnings. And I want to go back and watch this video and, and, and kind of parse that out a little bit. So thank you. There, there is a book that I would recommend to everyone here if you've never read it. Um, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century is Mortimer Adler. Uh, if you don't know Adler, he's an easy read, um, but one of his most insightful books is titled The Common Sense of Politics, written in the 1970s. Um, I have actually added it. I run a, uh, uh, an internet website project called the School of Cooperative Individualism, and in the online library, that book is available to be downloaded for free. Uh, and, but it is, it is a book that I would wish would be read and taught to every high school and college freshman uh, because it prov provides a, a great um, basic analysis of this question. What is the role, what is the right, the correct and just balance between property rights and individual rights what how do we determine whether law is just or not how do we and he asks how do we provide for a decent uh, human existence for all people as part of that human right um and he does he does it in a way that will get you thinking deeply about these questions Thank you very much for that uh, suggestions. I guess we're gonna close it uh, uh, at this point, Ed, because I don't see anybody raising hands, uh, but I think it was a fantastic presentation and also some very enlightening discussions. So we look thanks, forward- Thanks everyone for joining us. Exactly. And we look forward to see you soon at the Henry George School. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. This is wonderful.